Thank you for coming. Let's see. No, we'll be looking at First Corinthians chapter 15. First Corinthians chapter 15. Thank you. First Corinthians chapter 15. We're going to start to read a verse one. Moreover, brother, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received and wherein you stand. But which also ye are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. And that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. And that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. After that, he was seen of above 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, uh, but some are fallen asleep. After that, he was seen of James, then of all the apostles. And last of all, he was seen of me also, as one born out of due time. For I am not the least of the apostles, sorry, for I am the least of the apostles, and am not me to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain. But I labored the more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. Therefore, whether it were I or they, so we preach, and so ye believed. Now, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? And if Christ be not risen, then, your, then our preaching is vain, and your faith is also vain. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God. Because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, ye are yet in your sins. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. And then if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by men came death, by men came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, after they that are Christ is coming. Then cometh the end when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall put down all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign until he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. For he hath put all things under his feet. But when he saith all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is accepted, which put all things under him. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. Else what shall he do which are baptized for the dead? If the dead rise not at all, why are they then baptized? For the dead. And why stand we in jeopardy every hour? I protest by uh, your rejoicing, which I have in Christ Jesus, our Lord, I die daily. If after the manner of men I have fought with beasts at Ephesus, what advantage is it me if the dead rise not? Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt, corrupt good manners. Awake to righteousness and sin not. For some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. But some man will say, how are the dead raised up? And with what body do they come? Thou fool, that which thou sowest is not quick and except it die. And that which thou sowest, thou sowest not that body that it shall be, but uh, bare grain. It may chance of wheat or of some other grain. But God giveth it a body that it, as it has pleased him. And to every seed his own body. All flesh is not the same flesh. But there is one kind of flesh of men. Another flesh of beasts. Another of fishes. and Another of birds. There are also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial. But the glory of the celestial is one. And the glory of the terrestrial is another. 
There is one glory of the sun and another glory of the moon and another glory of the stars. For one star differeth from another star in glory. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickened spirit. Howbeit that which was not first, which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterward that which is spiritual. The first man is of the earth, earthy, and the second man is the Lord from heaven. As the earthy, such are they also that are earthy, and as the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the earthy, earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Now, that was quite a bit of reading, but I want to read one more place, and that's 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. First Thessalonians chapter four, and verse thirteen. <clears throat> but I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not as as others uh, which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with Him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Quite a lot of reading, but where are you going to stop? What are you going to leave out? Where are you going to make the break? I didn't know where to, so I read the whole chapter. First Corinthians chapter 15. I enjoyed looking at it this week and looking over it and looking at some of the words, and some of the situations that the apostle found himself in. And uh, the chapter is, what do we say? It's huge, isn't it? Um, we just started Titus in our weekly reading and we got down to the end of verse one on the first night. It, it just, it's the, the apostle, as he writes, he, he seems to take so many roads that he, and so many, there's so many leads that can be developed. Uh, and so here, when we're looking at first Corinthians 15, I, I found the same thing. There, there's so many things that we could go into, but we're, we're going to look at very basic tonight and very brief um, just to look at the chapter together. And hopefully uh, have something, have some spiritual food, have something not unique. Sometimes we try to say, well, let's find something unique that'll uh, get people's ears and get them. And we're, not, we're not trying to find something unique, but if we can find something that the Spirit of God is teaching. And if you've never heard it or thought of it before, well, maybe that's even that's better. That's good. But uh, again, we'll just go down through. Uh, the chapter, verses one and two, we have the gospel declared. 
gets received and it's standing and salvation. Uh, in verses three and four, we have the gospel is described what it is. Um, in verses uh, five to eight, we have the gospel and it's witness, the witness, it's witness, the witnesses that were there. In verses 9 through 11, we have the gospel affected, the effect of the gospel, the effect that it had upon them. In 12 to 19, we have the gospel and it's challenged. They were being, there was a challenge to the word that had been spoken. Verses 20 and 23, uh, we have the gospel and it's confirmed. He confirms it by what had done. In verses 24 and 29, we have the gospel and it's consummated. And in verses 30 and 34, we have the gospel and the experience that they had with the gospel. In verse 35, we come into really the what we want to look at tonight with the resurrection and in verse 35 we have the resurrection and it's challenged the challenge to the resurrection in verses 36 through 41 we have the resurrection and explained naturally he takes up the natural world and he shows the truth of resurrection and verses 42 to 50 the resurrection is explained and now it's spiritual and he takes the spiritual truth and he brings them to bear in verses 51 to 57 we have the resurrection in the ministry, in a mystery, and we'll have a look at that. And then the verse 58, the last verse, uh, is really the resurrection and the outcomes of the truth. The first section in verses 1 through 34, we have the facts of the resurrection. And then when we come to verse 35, we have that twofold question. So 35 to the end, we have the manner of the resurrection. In the chapter, we have the word raised, raised, raised up. I did a study one time, it was quite a number of years ago, and I was looking at the book of Acts, and I was trying to see there where the Lord Jesus raised himself. And to much to my surprise, I realized that the book of the Acts says this over and over again, whom God hath raised, whom God hath raised. And over and over again in the book of the Acts, this statement is made, whom God hath raised. And the resurrection of the Lord Jesus is accredited to God. And that's no wonder, is it? God approved of this man. God approved of, of his son. God approved of the work. And so the, the, the proof of his approval was he raised him from the dead. So the resurrection, it's, a, it's a, attributed to the power of God. It's also attributed to the Holy Spirit, isn't it? Because when we come to Romans chapter 8, the spirit that raised up Jesus. And then finally, it's attributed to the Lord Jesus himself. You remember his words? John chapter 10, concerning his life, he says, I have power to lay it down. He says, I have power to take it again. So the resurrection and the Trinity, it's attributed to the Father, to God, and the Spirit and the Lord Jesus himself. When we come to verses 1 and 2, we really have a statement that Paul says to them, that you received. He says, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preach, which he also, they received it. They were in, they stand, whereby they are saved. What does it say? A threefold cord is not easily broken. And so here it is, the threefold cord. They received it. A point in time when they received that message, that's salvation. To receive the message that the gospel, that they were preaching in the gospel, that was salvation. Where they stand, their present position, what we have today and where we stand in the gospel is what, it's what we depend upon, isn't it? It's what we put our faith in. And so where they stand. And then the salvation that we know from David. Just the, the salvation, the ongoing uh, outworking of the salvation that they receive. When we come to verse 5, we have the witnesses, don't we? So, in any court of law, I haven't been in very many of them, but we've been in a few. And they're witnesses, aren't they? And a first-hand witness, someone who saw something, is very reliable, isn't it? Of course, if they're truthful, but a firsthand witness is very reliable, and 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 their evidence uh, brings a lot to bear in the court, doesn't it? So what do we have here? First, we have Cephas, Peter. Peter had a, a meeting with the Lord Jesus, the resurrected Lord Jesus. 
Now, there's good evidence that this was a private meeting. There's evidence that, the, that Peter and the Lord Jesus had a private meeting. You say, well, they met on the seashore. Yes, they did. That was public, wasn't it? There's good evidence that this was a private meeting that uh, in Luke chapter 24, it says he's appeared unto Simon. So there's a, a, a private meeting with Peter and the Lord Jesus and he's restored. Isn't that great? Isn't it lovely to be restored? It's terrible to get away. We never, we never recommend anybody to get away from the Lord. What did Mr. Ramsey always say? Keep short accounts with God. Keep short accounts. Don't get away. But if a person does get away, isn't it wonderful? Peter denied him. Peter denied him three times. But he was repentant of it. It touched his conscience. He had, he had a, a soft conscience about it. And so here he is restored both privately and publicly. Then we have the 12. The official title for the apostles is the 12. You say, well, there wasn't 12. No, not at that time, was there? But that was the name that they were called by. When the Lord Jesus had his 12 disciples, now they're the 12 apostles, and they're given this, tip, this title, the 12. And so they, he appears unto them. So that's 13, right? Cephas and the 12. Maybe only 12. But now 500. If someone comes and tells you something, and one person tells you, Depending on the confidence that you have in that person, you may or may not say, well, this is a fact or not. If two people come and tell you, then you start to think, well, you know, this maybe there's something to this. If 500 people came and said that they had seen the Lord Jesus, it's, it's irrefutable, isn't it? You can't, you can't take 500 people and say, you're, you're wrong. And so here we have the, the no doubts. There was no, there'd be no doubts. Uh, of the resurrection with the 500. And then uh, another witness is James. James. And some of the commentators tell us that this is the Lord's brother, James. Uh, in Galatians chapter 1, we have James, the Lord's brother, mentioned there. And so amazing, isn't it? Here he is. And he's lived with these family members. He's lived with them for all the, the, the time he was there with, in his life. And they didn't believe on him. Even his brethren didn't believe on him. And yet here he is. And he appears to James, his, his brother. He has direct dealings with his family. And then it says, all the apostles. You say, well, he's already mentioned the 12. But now he says, all the apostles. Some have suggested that perhaps Matthias is there. And it's the ascension. And then now he says, Paul, he himself had a revelation. Of the Lord Jesus, who art thou, Lord, on the Damascus, Damascus road? And then that great statement, Lord, what will have me to do? So here we have the witnesses to the resurrection. In verse 12, we come, uh, now we have the denial, the denial of the resurrection. Now, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, that's what they preached in the gospel. How say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? So what he's going to do, he's going to use positive truth. Positive truth to combat error. And that's a good, a good method, isn't it? That's a good tool. That's a good lesson for us, isn't it? I remember working with a, a man, and he was a Christian man, but he said he had gotten this book on a particular cult, he says, I'm going to study all I can about this call. Find out everything I can about them. So I'm going to be able to, when they come to my door, if I meet them, I'm going to be able to, to challenge them on, on what they believe. Does that sound like a good idea? I remember talking to one of the brethren about it, and they said, well, study the truth. Study the word of God. And when these things, when you know this book, when you know the, the teachings from the scriptures, then when they bring up these things, you can say, well, that's not what the Bible says. And then when, you, when they knock on their, your door and they say this and that, you say, well, that's not what the Bible says. And so here Paul, he takes uh, positive truth to, to correct the error. 
In verses 14 and 19, we have the sevenfold result of no resurrection. Did they think about this? That these ones that were saying there's no resurrection, did they think about the results? Did they think about the, the uh, outcome of, of this teaching? He says, if there's no resurrection, he says, why do we preach? It's vain. He says, if there's no resurrection, faith is vain. He says, if there's no resurrection, he says, we're false witnesses. No resurrection. Again, he says, their faith is vain. And, and then uh, you're getting your sins. If there's no resurrection, you're in your sins. And so these uh, dead saints, they perished if there's no resurrection. And living saints, <laughs> they're miserable. He says that we're all men most miserable if there's no resurrection. You see, to take a wrong path, to take a wrong path, sometimes you, you don't really realize how far that path is going to go. Do you? I remember a trip to uh, Sackville, New Brunswick, to the university when Nathan was there. And we went and took the trip and I was a little tired, so I said, you can drive on the way home. So I fell asleep and I woke up. And when I woke up, I looked over and on the way to New Glasgow, there's a red burn beside the highway on the divided highway right there. And that's what I woke up and saw. And so when I woke up and saw the red burn, I thought, we're on the wrong road. Now we'd gone about 40 minutes out of our way to get to this point. And I said, well, didn't you see that sign? It said, only exit to Halifax, only exit. Right? It says two kilometers. Or so. uh, yeah, I said, but I thought there was going to be another way. I thought there was going to be another way to, to pick that up. You see, when, we, when you start down a, a wrong road, you have to turn around, don't you? And that's really repentance, isn't it? You have to turn around. You have to get back on the right road. And so here are these uh, ones that were saying uh, no resurrection. They didn't realize the results of it. Um, in verse 20, we have the, uh, the truth of the first fruits. Here is the Lord Jesus being the first fruit in the resurrection. He rose from the dead. He's raised up. And with the first fruits, we have the truth of the uh, a promise of future blessing, don't we? You know, we, we, see the, we see the farmers now, and some of them, and they're cutting hay. Now, I, I, I don't know, I know hardly, hardly anything about farming. Uh, and less about hay but they tell me that the first cut of hay is the best i remember that i used to know a farmer he said if i can just get that first cut off he said i can sell that because that's worth a lot of money the first one he said i'll just use the the, the next stuff that comes along but if i can get that first that first b- b- bunch of hay that, that's just the idea isn't it the first fruits it's the best and here the lord jesus he's the best of the harvest and there's a promise of a future blessing in verses 21 and 22, we, he brings in the truth of Adam, and he brings in the truth of the Lord Jesus. The first Adam and the last Adam. No need for another. The last Adam, he's, he's the last one. He's the last one that's going to come as, as a federal head. There's no need of another. And so we have this uh, with Adam and Christ. And so what you all been waiting for. When we come to verse 29, well, I probably won't solve any problems for anybody tonight, but um, we're reading his commentary, Jack Hunter, and his commentary says there's over 30 explanations that have been given for verse 29. So I don't think we're going to solve it tonight. Um, he has his idea of the ranks of soldiers filling the, filling the ranks. And if there's no battle to be won, if the, if the battle is not being won, it's, it's futile to fill the ranks in, in as far as people being baptized and added to the assembly and things like that. Uh, Mr. Vine changes the punctuation a little bit to make it read differently. We'll just look at three things about it. First of all, it's water baptism. Baptism is baptism, water baptism. 
It's not an analogy. It's not. And when we think of baptism, what does it speak? It speaks of death and burial and resurrection, doesn't it? So water baptism. Uh, it also speaks of a physical death. Those that have died, it's a physical death. And the little word F-O-R, for, is the word for substitution. It's a substitute. And so, again, we'll leave that one with the 30 other explanations that go with it. Um, we're going to drop down to verse 35. Verse 35 now, he's bringing to bear the truth of the resurrection. There's twofold question. First of all, how are the dead raised up? How are they raised up? That's a question, isn't it? That's a, that, to, a, to an inquiring mind, to somebody who's, who's thinking about these things, how are the dead raised up? That's a good question. And then he says, and with what body do they come? So first of all, he's going to talk about the body that they come. And he's going to go down and he's going to uh, have examples from nature and examples from scripture. Excuse me. First, he says in verse 39, all flesh is not the same flesh. So here, it's really a, a the death blow to evolution, isn't it? The scripture, and this scripture tells us that there is no progression from one species to another. Okay? If we believe or accept whatever the evolutionists try to teach, there is some kind of a life form crawled out of a pond. Where to come from? We, we don't have a good explanation for that. Crawled out of a pond and, and developed and developed into this and into that. And if you look at the, the, the charts, it, it, a little creature, and then it turns into some, something that's standing up, and then it's an ape, and then it's a man. That's a change in species, isn't it? Because we have apes, we have little creatures, we have things that crawl out of ponds already. We still have them, but they don't change. And this is what he says here. All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh of man, another of beasts, another of fishes, and another of birds. And so species are unique, and they stay unique. Someone says, well, what about, what about a horse and a donkey? Yeah, okay, that is only partial, isn't it? Because they're sterile. The mule is sterile. The offspring of that is sterile. So it's not going to propagate. There's, not, there's no change there. So here he says in the resurrection that the flesh, and, all, and as well, he says, what is sown determines what's coming up. Now, one of the best gardens I ever saw was our brother Lionel's. Uh, and, but I don't know anything about gardening either. I planted a garden a couple of times, but then you end up with so many enemies that I gave it up. Uh, raccoons and... My brother Bruce plants a garden, and he plants a big garden too. And I was helping him one time. We were planting tomato plants, and uh, we planted the little tomato plants over here. And we turned around, and Bruce says, "Look at that!" And turned around, and two of them had, were cut off. The, the little things, the little things are falling over. And he says, "There's a cutworm in there." And he dug around, he found this little bug. He had an enemy in his garden. It was a cutworm. He killed his two little tomato plants. But what is sown determines what's coming, what's going to grow, right? And he tells them that. He says, some is wheat, some is grain. What you put into the ground determines what comes out. That's resurrection. That's the truth of resurrection, isn't it? The body is sown. The body, and when you sow a seed, it's not talking about death, is it? The seed has to die to, to become the plant that grows. But it's not talking about, it's talking about being sown. And so that's what uh, the believers, they're sown, isn't it? And something that is sown there's a hope. There's a hope for it, isn't there? When it's sown, there's a hope that you're going, you're going to see something else. Um, in verses 42 and 43, he applies it. Verse 42, so also is the resurrection of the dead. 
It is sown in corruption, so people die. That's a truth. It's sown in corruption, but it is raised in incorruption. It is, uh, it is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory, sown in weakness, raised in power, sown in natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. And then he makes a bold statement. There is a natural body. And there is a spiritual body. Based on his argument about resurrection, about comparing it to uh, being uh, what was planted and so on, he says there is a spiritual body. Now, if you can start to look at some of the commentaries and you can start to look at some of the ideas, but God's going to raise you, a believer, if, the, if death takes us, and God's going to raise me. If death overtakes me, raised up. That's the truth of resurrection. Here it is. He comes down, he goes a little farther. In verse 51, he says, Now, he says, Behold, I show you a mystery. The twofold question in verse 35 How are the dead raised up, and with what body do they come? And with what body do they come? He's shown if they come in a spiritual body. How are the dead rise raised? Now he says, behold, I show you a mystery. A mystery. Now, mysteries in scripture are not mysterious. Does that make sense? They're not mysterious. Men have made all kinds of things about things that are mysterious and that only they know or only certain uh, people can know. That's not what, what the Bible talks about as a mystery. Is it? A mystery in the scripture is truth that was not revealed in the Old Testament is now revealed in the New. Truth revealed, and that is the truth of mystery, uh, the mystery of the scripture. Uh, Ephesians chapter 3 and Romans chapter 16 both reinforce that. There's 14. That is 14. I had, I had 12. I just looked in, uh, in here. This is 14. Maybe you have more. If you have more, let me know. Um, mysteries in the scriptures. Uh, the kingdom of the heavens in Matthew chapter 13, a mystery. The blindness of Israel in Romans chapter 11. The change at the rapture will be up here. God's will in Ephesians chapter 1. The Jew and the Gentile in Ephesians chapter 3, the mystery. Christ in the church. Uh, the mystery of Ephesians chapter 5, the mystery in the gospel of Ephesians chapter 6, the indwelling of the Lord Jesus Christ in Colossians chapter 1, the mystery of iniquity in 2 Thessalonians 2, the faith in 1 Timothy 3, godliness, great is the mystery of godliness, 1 Timothy 3. When we come to Revelation, there's three more, the seven stars and the seven lampstands in Revelation chapter 1. God in mystery in Revelation chapter 10, Babylon the Great, mystery of the Bible on the Great, Revelation chapter 17. So the mysteries, the truth revealed, and now he's going to tell them, he's going to show them, he's going to reveal the truth of the resurrection. I read in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 because it gives us more details about this event of what's going to happen. We shall not all sleep but we all, we shall all be changed. So was he anticipating the rapture? I think he was. Was he anticipating the, this event that will take place? I think he was. He had already told them that what was sown was going to be brought back. What, what, what the, the, the believer that died was going to be raised up. But now he says, We're not, we might, might not all die. He says, we shall not all sleep. And that's the word for uh, a believer dying is sleep. Um, but we shall all be changed. It's, it's thrilling, really, isn't it? To read it in a moment. Uh, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. In a moment, the moment is really the smallest division of time. If you look at the word moment, an atom of time. So atoms, when we're talking in science, are the smallest things that you can't divide into something else. Molecules have, have atoms in them, but if you draw a divide, then you get to the very smallest, you have an atom. And he says here, in a moment, in an atom of time, 
And the twinkling of an eye. Remember Mr. Crawford, Mr. Norman Crawford. He said, that's just the up looking. As long as it takes you to look up. That's the moment. Another thing Mr. Crawford said. In connection with 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. The dead in Christ shall rise first. And we which are alive and remain shall be caught up. He said, and it's quite a thing to think of, isn't it? That for one moment in this world, every born-again soul is going to stand together. God's power is such that every believer is going to stand together in that moment before we're caught up to meet the Lord in the air. A testimony. You remember what that happened when the Lord Jesus Ray was, was uh, in the ascension in, in Acts chapter 1? It says they, they saw him blow up. Where is he passing through? He's passing through the realm of Satan, the prince of the power of the air, and he has no power to stop him. And when the, when the believers are gathered and we're all standing, I put it shoulder to shoulder, maybe not. It's going to be a great company, isn't it? Multitudes. I forget who said they could, that God could uh, populate heaven from the Ganges River. So many babies were put in that river to, to die. All stand together and all caught up to meet the Lord in the air. The last trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. Remember, this is, this is the answer. How are the dead raised up? This is how. This is it. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, this mortal must put on immortality. The result of it in 50, verse 54, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? When we stand in a grave today, there's a sting of death, isn't there? There's a sting of death. We don't like it. It's something to be feared. It's something that we do fear. But there's a coming day when this, when this from, is it Hosea, comes true. Hosea chapter 13. Oh, death, where is thy sting? Adam. For as by one man sin entered the world and death by sin. And so death has passed upon all men. Adam. Didn't realize what he did, I don't think. Didn't know where this road would lead when he sinned. When he disobeyed God. But now here, because of our Lord Jesus Christ. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. The twinkling of an eye. Now he says, verse 58. Here's the outcome. Here's the practical, the, the practical experience for, for the believer. Therefore, my beloved brother, be steadfast, unmovable, uh, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know, that your labor, listen to it, is not in vain. He's, he's given this argument of so many things would be vain. So many things would be worthless if there is no resurrection. And now he says the resurrection. There is a resurrection. And he says your labor is not in vain. It's not in vain. It's not, it's not useless. It's not wasted. Your labor for him is not wasted. Why? Because of the resurrection. Because of a raised a raised up, resurrected Lord Jesus Christ. And so we look forward to this, don't we? We look forward to the resurrection. We look forward to that shout that's going to be given. You know, reading First Thessalonians chapter 4, it was really something that spoke to me when I was in my sins. When I first heard the truth of First Thessalonians chapter 4 with the coming of the Lord, I, maybe I wasn't that bright, but I was this bright anyway. I thought, I believe what I'm being told. I believe that what's being said. So if I believe that the Lord Jesus could come at any moment, the person that was telling me was a Christian, I said to myself, I could be here. I could be saved by, by myself at any moment. You say that's God's scare tactic. It wasn't a scare tactic. It was an awakening for me. And I realized I wasn't ready to meet God. And so the truth of the resurrection, it has gospel applications, doesn't it? It has eternal applications. And here he says, always abounding, it has present applications as well. Shall we pray?
<clears throat> our God, our Father, we now commend our ways to thee and give thanks again for the great truth of the resurrection. We thank thee for an empty tomb where our Lord Jesus lay. There in a body that was not energized by, by blood. He could say flesh and bones. Uh, he, he could see, tell them that, that they could see them. And yet, in this, we have the truth of the first fruit. He was the first one. And we are those that will follow. What a joy that will be that day. We are almost bittersweet sometimes when we think of it, when we remember our loved ones, and those that we know that are not saved. Oh, God, have mercy, we pray. Come in and save souls would be our desire. Help us that we may be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. And we do ask thy blessing now as we pray. In the worthy name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. <clears throat> Maybe we just sing. There's only three verses. 344. 300.